Hello, everyone. My name is John Boone, and I am the health science librarian here at Brackett Library. I also do liaison work for the chemistry department and the College of Business. Today, we're going to talk about the basically the scientific research method process. We're going to talk about information sources and what's available, and how to evaluate those sources, such as journal articles and the internet resources so you can find the best quality and then we're going to sum that up by looking at the library and its resources and how you can go about finding articles books and journals through there so to begin i'm going to um, share my screen with everyone our screen and i'm going to start out we're going to talk a little bit about the scientific research process and these are the steps that are involved in the scientific research process. First, you state or identify a problem. Then you formulate a research question. You review the literature so you can better understand what is already out there and what, where the problem may lie. Then you collect data. And then you have the methods or tests that are used to, uh, such as statistical analysis usually. Then there's the results that are uh, usually published in a paper, and then the discussion and conclusion. So let's start by looking at what we state or identify a problem. Basically, all scientific investigations start with a specific research question and the form formulation of a hypothesis to answer this question. The hypothesis should be clear, specific, and directly aim to answer the research question. The next step is they, you formulate a research question. When you begin exploring a clinical research issue of interest, it is recommended to first frame the question or problem statement uh, so that it is not overly broad. Write the research question or problem statement using the PICO method, and we'll talk about that next. PICO method it stands for patient, patient group, or problem, or population, uh, usually consisting of uh, age, sex, race, condition, or disease, care setting, et cetera, especially for a medical setting. And you have the intervention type of test, uh, basically, that you'd like to try, tests or therapy, clinical procedure, it's going to be tested. Then there's always a comparison. Sometimes it's just a placebo, which is uh, basically nothing is done to a group, just so you can kind of compare, or you'll compare it to what's sometimes referred to as a gold standard, something that's already been proven and acceptable to see how this new concept or new drug, for example, compares with the gold standard. Then you'll come up with, then you have the outcomes which are the measurement result and effect, whether it was effective or whether the results were as good as the, um, as the gold standard or didn't quite measure up. Then the T that's sometimes added on to that is the time frame or even the type of study, uh, type of uh, question for the study, such as, is it for diagnosis, is it for treatment, um, and, and so on. Uh, for example, Here's one that's from a medical setting. Uh, the patient here is a middle-aged, are middle-aged male amputees suffering from phantom limb pain. And there is a drug that's called gabapentin, and it's being compared with either a placebo or against other treatments, such as I mentioned earlier, a gold standard treatment. And then the outcome was to find out was it as, as effective um, and decreasing pain as the placebo or other treatments, such as the gold standard compared in the study. And then you'd also could add on a time or type of study additionally there. Then the next step here, after the getting the question, you wanna further clarify the problem. You gotta have the problems can be identified by the researcher, then you must learn, then you'll have the uh, review of the literature. So by reviewing the literature, you see what's out there, what 
how the problem could be better addressed, so what major problems maybe you might encounter. So you conduct a review of the literature related to the research question. And this review will provide you with foundational knowledge about the problem areas. And it also educates the researcher about what studies have already been conducted and how they were conducted and also the conclusions that were drawn. So that will better inform you as you go forward with your research. Now you clarify the problem. Many times in the initial problem identified in the first step of the process is either too large or broad in scope. Um, here the researcher must clarify the problem and narrow the scope of the study. You don't want to be looking at something like just the study of viruses, for example, because there are entire sets of encyclopedias that are dedicated to just viruses. So you need to narrow that topic down quite a bit. I think of it as a research funnel, where at the top it's real broad, and you want to narrow it down until you come to this little, what I call the sweet spot area, where you're going to find not too many resources, not too few resources, but a good amount of resources that will still be able to help you with your research. So you clarify the problem, you narrow the scope, um, this can only be done after you've already reviewed the literature, which we just did in the previous, would have done in the previous step. The original problem may have to be modified and also restated. So you might have to tweak your original question, which is understandable. That, that sometimes happens in research. Um, next, you'll kind of define the population. If you're going to do a, a study involving people, research can be, uh, can focus on a specific group of people or a population. Uh, there are the research problem uh, and the purpose of the study to assist the researcher in identifying the group or population to study. By defining the population, that uh, it helps by narrowing the scope of the study. The population identifies the group that the researcher's effort is going to be focused on. And it also helps to ensure that the researcher identifies the group that the results will apply to at the conclusion of the study. You want to make sure that you're, you are um, performing the tests and the study on the group you intended originally. Instrumentation plan. This is the roadmap for the entire, your entire study. The scientist will specify who will participate in the study, how, when, and where data will be collected, and the content of the program. Uh, this also specifies all the steps that must be made, that must be, sorry, must be completed for the study. It defines, defines uh, defining the population, it, it helps all of these things. So basically, then you start the collection of the data, and this provides information needed be analyzed uh, to answer the research question. The data can be collected in numerous different ways, depending on the nature of the research question. For example, you could even do surveys. Uh, you can do observations. There could be clinical trials, if this is a, uh, a drug, for example, or a particular therapy. Uh, you can also look at just the literature that's out there. Um, you can also use a data from medical test results, experiments, etc. There are many different ways to collect the data. Once you've collected the data, then the, you then the then the scientists will analyze the data. Statistical analysis of the data is this is what's involved in this section. The results of the analysis are reviewed and summarized in a matter directly related to the research question. And you have the, any differences in the analysis will be examined to determine if they are statistically significant. If the differences are statistically significant, try saying that three times fast, the study validates the original theory that was the focus of the study. Then you'll know that the treatment either is success or is not a success. So that's the step, those are the steps involved in the scientific research process. So next we're going to jump in and just kind of go to switching gears a little bit and we're going to talk about information sources that are available to you that you could use. Okay, the first one we're going to look at are what's called what are known as journals. 
and they're different than magazines, and that's what we're going to talk about right now, the differences in journals and magazines. A journal is scholarly. So what is a scholarly journal? They're academic journals. They are periodicals, which means they come out on a regular basis, usually monthly, sometimes bi-monthly or even weekly, and um, in which researchers publish articles on their work. Most often, these articles discuss recent research. Journals also publish uh, theoretical discussions and articles that critically review, they are critically reviewed, and they review already published work. Uh, academic journals are peer reviewed. So we're going to talk about peer review in just a second. But so what's the purpose of the scholarly articles? Well, as we've already said, the scholars, uh, scientists will write them so in order to share ideas with their peers, usually within their own academic disciplines, such as health sciences, chemistry, physics, literature, psychology. Articles, uh, they fall under the realms of research reports, presentations of, and those are presentations of an original study or studies. Literature review articles discussing existing uh, research about a problem and suggests paths for future studies. These would be kind of called systematic reviews. And then you have theoretical articles, which discusses existing theories that explain observations and often proposes new theories or new perspective on theories. Because they already share highly specified, uh, a specialized background, they often assume that their readers already understand some of the fundamental knowledge in the field, which is often referred to as the jargon or like technical jargon that's used in the field. Let's go back and mention about, talk a little bit about what we mentioned previously, peer reviewed. What is peer reviewed? Well, getting a, an article published in, uh, in uh, peer reviewed uh, academic journals usually involves three or four steps. By the way, peer-reviewed is also called refereed. Basically what happens is step one, you submit an article manuscript for consideration. The journal editors will submit the article uh, to other scholars who do similar work and are experts in the area, in the field that you're, you're doing your research in. And then they're, therefore they are qualified to review the article. Generally, the editors will not send submissions to be reviewed by, uh, by three others. Generally, editors will send submissions to be reviewed by three other scholars. Editors will then uh, evaluate the reviews and decide whether to reject or accept the submission. Usually, the response is either a rejection or an acceptance contingent on the author's making of some revisions. If the author is asked to make revisions, they are to edit and resubmit the article for another round of reviews. Sometimes the article is accepted at this point, and other times uh, authors are asked to make further revisions. So the review process basically guarantees quality. You have experts in your field, let's say chemistry, they or other chemists will go in and they will review this work and they can determine whether or not it's quality work. They're also familiar with the types of analysis and statistical analysis. And so they can see if your statistics are good and then therefore if the results are good and can be trusted. That's the peer reviewed process. Now, we talked about scholarly journals. Well, these are magazines here. We're gonna talk about this is just your common, here's a picture your average normal magazines, you've got Time, you've got National Geographic, uh, all these different magazines, there's Men's Journal, different ones on here, you kind of understand where, People Magazine would also be one. So magazines, here's the comparison. Which is which? Well, if it's scholarly, scholarly journals usually, uh, they have few illustrations. They have graphs and, and, and charts. There's very few, if any, advertising, usually for academic services or scientific processes, if there are any advertising at all. The articles are lengthy with uh, bibliographies. The author is listed with his or her credentials. 
uh, usually part of a university, and the article discusses uh, original research. Popular magazines, like we said, Time, People, those various ones, and there are a lot of others. Uh, they have mil many illustrations, usually glossy or color photos, uh, many advertisements, usually for consumer products, short articles just for entertainment purposes, no, bibli no bibliographies. The author may or may not be listed and the credential and credentials are rare. Uh, it's they're usually a staff or freelance writer. Plus, the, they have editors uh, that are not experts in the field that edit the articles in magazines where the scholarly journals are edited by other experts in the field. And these articles here in magazines, they cover uh, just general interest kind of topics. So here's another example. We have People magazine, it's normally a glossy cover. And it's just kind of uh, little articles that are kind of in, maybe some people would be interested in. And then the inside is nothing but full of images and little uh, snippets rather than uh, lengthy articles. And then you have the Journal of the American Medical Association. Even the cover is just the table of contents. So you just have a listing of what articles are in there. It's like just the facts. That's all it is to it. And then you open it up and you turn to one of the articles and here it is. And it'll tell you everything in there about the objectives and what kind of studies, uh, what kind of tests were done, what the studies and the results and the conclusions. And you can go and uh, flip this page and you just start reading the whole article. And then it's that way through the entire journal because there's no room for illustrations, uh, glossy pictures, and there's no need for it. So that's a um, magazine. Now we're going to switch a little bit and talk about books. Um, one of the things about books is the relevancy compared to scholarly journal articles which are published in by the thousands literally every day. Um, they're much more timely, much more relevant, but don't discount books. Uh, there are books out there that are um, classics in the in the particular in a particular field which means are they're they're basically timeless uh, they hold value when they were written say in the 1930s and they would hold value still today because they were the you know they're also referred to as seminal works in the field so don't discount the value of books so now in evaluating books in step one you want to look at the authority of the authorship Who's the author and what, what's, what's their expertise in the subject area? Do they have professional affiliations? Was their work experience or education relevant? Um, are there any other publications that they've done that are relevant? Uh, is the information contained in the book still relevant? But keep in mind how I said that there are some works that are classics in the field and they are always relevant. They're timeless. Um, whereas a book on, uh, for example, maybe astronomy written in 1913, obviously, is not going to be relevant today with all the discoveries that have been made since 1913. Uh, another thing to consider is, has the book been updated? Is this a newer edition? And as therefore the information has been kind of updated as well. These are things uh, to consider in step one in evaluating books. And step two, look at the coverage and the relevance. Is the book relevant to your topic? Uh, does it have the depth you require? Review the table of contents in the index. To confirm if the information you require is covered in the book and uh, to what extent. And that's step two. Step three, purpose in the audience. What's the author's motivation or agenda here? Is it to entertain, persuade, uh, further knowledge in the field? Who are the intended readers? Uh, content may vary depending on the book's targeted audience. If the book was written for an older audience or was it written for high school or teen audience? It's gonna have uh, different content. 
is it very general and introduce, it could be very general and introduce the reader to a subject. And at the other extreme, it could be very specific, aimed at uh, other scholars in the field. So that's evaluating the book, step three. Step four, accuracy and documentation. Is there a bibliography or a list of references at the back of the book? Can you identify the research data? What was the editorial process? And all this information should be in the first few pages of the book or in the flaps as well, the front and back flaps, or maybe even on the back cover. Is this information reliable? Um, that would uh, kind of depend on your expertise and how to go about analyzing to whether or not they're, the conclusions of this author, whichever author or authors of this book, whether their conclusions are reliable or not. So you can base that on your expertise in the subject, or you can look at book reviews, which are also very helpful. And it's a book review is basically other authors going about reviewing a book, which they are somewhat knowledgeable in that field. So that can also help in evaluating books. Step five, and the last step for books is objectivity and thoroughness. What perspectives are given or ignored? Be alert for bias. The author may represent only one side of a topic or of an argument. Um, look for research that provides evidence that drives the conclusion reached by the author. Always look at the research sections. Um, you might, a lot of people like to literally jump to conclusions and they'll read the conclusion and think, wow, this is great. But then when you go to the uh, research or methods section, um, then the methods taketh away from what the conclusion giveth. So, but trust, but verify. You can trust, but always go back and verify what the author is saying. Check the research. And also, another thing to consider is check who, um, outside the realm of just books, this is, this is just for sources in general, whenever research is done, there's some, oftentimes there's funding. There's going to be funding for research. You always hear about scientists looking for funding. Find out who's funding the study. Follow the money. Who's funding a particular study? I mean, if you see something that says that uh, smoking doesn't cause cancer or that nicotine is not a, a, a carcinogenic chemical, and then you look and you see the research was funded by Philip Morris, the tobacco company, yeah, you might kind of wonder about that. So uh, always follow the money, the funding. All right, let's talk about evaluating the internet sources. Can't I just Google it? And I hear that quite a bit. Well, I say, consider the source. I'm gonna click, I'm sorry, let me go back here. I'm gonna click on this and see if this will play in here. And this kind of gives you an example of the internet. So now it's back to me here. So I'm going to go back and go back into my PowerPoint slide. And we were here we go. Sorry about this. Let's go back to where we were here. Internet sources. Internet sources. Okay, so obviously everything on the internet should all know that by now. But I'm going to look at a little bit of a few things where you can kind of better evaluate internet sources. The term .com, uh, basically everybody ref refers to that, and they're talking about, well, it's a .com. You know, well, .com refers to the domain name of a website. 
uh, sites on the web are always grouped by their URLs according to the type of organization providing the information on the site. Uh, the domain suffix provides you with a clue about the purpose of the audience of a website. Um, it also may give you a clue about the geographic origin of the website. I've come across a lot of sites that say .au, which is Australia, or .ca, which is Canada. Others that you see more common, you have the typical, as we just said, .com. That's .commercial. Those are commercial sites. You'd find that at uh, generalmotors.com or um, Ford.com. Um, so they're, they're, they're commercial. They're trying to sell you something. Money's involved with that. That's, that's, that's what they're for. And they're, they're there to make money. .edu, well, that's like Harding or any other educational institution. Um, .edu's are fairly reputable. Um, I would tend to trust a .edu, but again, those other uh, things we just talked about, they all apply going into evaluating, you know, is there a bias here? Are the statistics accurate using the right statistical methods for a particular test? Um, are the conclusions uh, valid based on the methods used? You still really need to look at all those things, but generally, uh, .edu can be trusted. .gov, they can be trusted. CDC.gov, um, for example, is, an, is one. You can go and, and look at the census.gov. Anything that's .gov is, is very, very trustworthy. Uh, information from .orgs. That's kind of on the line, just maybe, maybe not. Um, you really, again, just have to look at it and really kind of scrutinize it because, you know, you have dot, dot .orgs out there that are very good at providing information. And others, they can have an agenda just like anything else. They may have an agenda or kind of a slant to them. One uh, would look at it maybe from like a political lens. Uh, is, is this overly conservative or is this overly... Um, um, liberal or whatever the case may be. Uh, dot mil, that's military. You're rarely going to encounter any of those. Um, dot net, that's, that would be like a, a personal, a lot of those are like personal websites or blogs, for example, would have dot net on there. Um, uh, whether or not that might bring up, raise the question, can you trust a blog? Um, I would not for scholarly. I'm not saying that people write, there aren't people out there who write blogs that have very good information. I mean, that there probably are, but it's about evaluation. And I would rather have something that's more trustworthy and has kind of gone through a filtering process to filter out the garbage. Cause you could go to a blog site where somebody's going to tell you that, you know, drinking water causes cancer or something. So, I mean, uh, our 9-11 never happened kind of conspiracy people. And so, nah, stay away from those. Um, now, evaluating websites. We talked about a little bit just a minute ago there. Authority. Is there an author or indication of sponsorship? What, what credentials uh, does, do they have? Are they experts on the topic? Remember, anyone can publish on the web. They don't have to know what they're talking about to do so. Um, is there a list of sources provided with the website where you can check? So what's the authority of that website? What about currency? Information that's outdated may be incorrect or incomplete. A well-maintained website uh, will generally tell you at the bottom of the page when it was last updated and maybe when it was created and made available. If you see a website that's got uh, very much, very looks very outdated and a lot of broken links, then it's probably not being maintained and it's probably not a good site to trust. Links, uh, an informational website in which all the hyperlinks are broken, as I just mentioned, that may not be a very reliable source. It also indicates the website isn't being maintained on a regular basis and it's probably just been completely neglected. Comparison, always compare the information that you find on a website with other information sources. 
generally, you wouldn't want to use uh, wouldn't want to use only websites for as support for a research paper. Uh, you should also be looking at other sources, such as books and scholarly articles as well. Um, how does the information found in the various formats compare? That way, you can look and see if the uh, information in a journal article or in a book and even other internet sources, how they compare with this one particular source that you're thinking about using. Okay, well that takes us back. I want to go in and we're going to, we're going to look at some of the sources uh, and resources that are available to you here at Bracket Library. So Bracket Library is our main page here. You can get to that at library.harding.edu. This is our home page. And I'm going to show you how you can access um, the sites where you can uh, where you could book a research consultation. You would just go to this uh, main bar at the top here and there's the research tab. Click on that. And then it's going to have uh, schedule a consultation with the librarian. And then these are all the different librarians and their subject specialties, uh, what they can they can help you with, and all throughout the library. And I'm right up here at the top here. Um, there's all the different subjects that I uh, oversee or work with, and you can just click this link here to book a, a consultation. And it will open up into a calendar, which I haven't got completely updated yet, but I have had several people schedule, which has been great. And then this will send me an email saying that you booked the time and you'd like to come and have a consultation. We're doing all of these virtually right now, so we're doing them through Google Meets, which is fine. I can just talk to you that way and I can show you just as I'm showing you right now. And you can contact me as well through email. And my office number is also listed on this site. You can contact me that way. And I would be more than happy to help you with finding research or if you have a research question, um, whatever I can do to help out. So let's go ahead and look at some of the other features on this page. Uh, here we have research, and then we go down to research guides, which is just right above where I showed you how you can book a consultation. Research guides, and then you've got by subject. You can do all guides. So if we come down here for chemistry, the research guides that we have for chemistry, and I'm adding to these uh, fairly regularly. Another uh, different site that you might consider looking is also in health science. I have even more listed in health science and one that would prove to be very helpful for you when it comes to finding articles and properly citing them because we always properly cite our journal articles and our books and anything, any sources that we use is the patient manual home site here. And this will have information about 6th edition, 7th edition. We've got all these are 7th edition sources. These are 6th and 7th. Purdue uh, OWL, which you might have heard of before, is the online uh, writing lab. And they currently are doing APA 7th edition, which is the newest. But they also have a page on their site that goes back and looks at APA 6th. And they've got all the information on that. Um, scroll down and here's just resources down here dedicated to the 6th edition. We have both the new 7th edition and the 6th edition manuals here at the library. And another thing that's in the library but uh, that's not part of the library is the writing center. So if you have to write a paper and you need assistance with uh, whether it be organization or style or you know documentation, uh, they are more than happy to help you, and they're doing um, consultations online as well. You could click this link here. I'm going to open into a new tab. And then so what you would end up doing is you would just put in your email and your password, and you can kind of create an account and then go in and sit and schedule an appointment time to meet with uh, the people in the writing center. They're very helpful, very friendly folks. Um, one last thing to say about APA is if you're not sure which edition, because 7th just came out this year, if you're not sure which edition your teacher is using, because you know, several are still using 6th edition, and that's just fine, 
check with your professor. Ask them, are we using six or seven? Because you want to make sure you've got the right one and instead of having to go back and and restart in the middle of your paper and have to go back and change all of your citations. So just check with them. So let's go back to the bracket main page again. I want to go in and look at a few um, databases that we have. Um, well, first, let me talk about Power Search. This is Power Search here. And you can go into Power Search. It's somewhat similar to a Google search. And you can search by a keyword our title, our author. And so you can just do a general search for something like I've had searches here for various uh, journal titles. And, and if we've got it, it'll pull it up. And it's uh, and also here you could click on e-publications and uh, look again by title and see if we have that in an electronic publication. And uh, that's another way to do it. But I like to jump right into the databases, which is this button here in the middle. A to Z database list. And then so you've got an alphabetical bar across here which lists all of our databases. You can click on any of these and it'll take you to the beginning of that particular alphabetical listing. Um, or you can search here, all subjects right here at the top. And so you click on that and scroll down and then we've got chemistry and these are some databases that are real popular and very useful in chemistry. And I'm going to highlight the ones that I think that are probably some of the best ones. Um, one is the American Chemical Society Web Editions. So let's go into that. Yes, I'm logged in. And then uh, you can search. Here's your search bar up here at the top. And you have a list of all. The, if you can click on publications here. And it will give you a list of all of the journal titles that they have in their collection. Um, so that's the journal titles list here at publications. You could click there and see your past activity that you've done on this site, if you've done any. And then here you can search. You can, you see it puts a drop down menu here where you can actually, um, you could type in or scroll to find. If you wanna do a journal. And then so you could do the journal and you could put in if you know the volume number. A lot of times it's best just to do kind of a general search there. So um, I had played with this a little bit earlier. So I'm going to see if I can pull this one up that I had found. Uh, let's search for biochemistry. And... Let's see. So you notice you've got over 300,000 results for biochemistry. So we don't want that many. So there are limiters over here on the side. And this is a way that you can limit down. You can limit it. You can limit it to book chapters. So there's over uh, almost 8,800 uh, book chapters here titled biochemistry. Just two books. Interesting. And then over... Uh, 300,000 <clears> journal articles here on biochemistry, research articles. But what I want to do is try to go back and show you what we're going to do. Biochemistry. And it's not letting me do what I wanted to do. Volume six, page one. Let's just see if we can find the title biochemistry here. Biochemistry. Then we're going to search for that particular volume. Okay, and then the first page is this article here. So then you, you, that's, this is what the article would look like. And you could do a PDF full text of it here, or you can just read it online. But if you did a PDF full text, you're going to get the full text, which is only a two-page article. And uh, has the references here at the bottom, author information. And you could save this. You could just click on that and save it if you want it. Or you can print it off right here. 
So um, as well as doing research in here as far as typing in something, um, like if you wanted to look at, say, uh, no therapy, I guess it would help if I didn't pick up that C. Chemotherapy, and let's see, and chemotherapy and biochemistry. Let's search. So, and then we'll also, I want to put a limiter on here, and let's limit the results. You can even limit it down to like, say, last month. And so we get this article here. Um, when we get off into a lot of the scientific terms, I'm, that's not my area. My area is more of the health sciences. So I'm just kind of showing you how you can do some searches and find the articles. And here we go, we've got full text. And just like I mentioned, you can scroll through the article. And there's like what we talked about earlier, there's the results section. So there's the statistics that they did for the methods and then they've got their results they have more charts to represent their results um, and then eventually you get down to you've got your conclusion or the discussion section and then there's the conclusion and then of course one thing while we're here this is your reference sections at the end of an article these can be very good. If you find an article that you, for a paper that you're working on, if you find an article and then you uh, always look at the references. This is called uh, bibliographic mining. And because this author, if it's an article that's uh, interesting and applicable to your paper, odds are this author is going to be, has, has already pulled from previous articles that he's done in his own research that are going to be somewhat similar. So you could scroll through and look at articles this individual has pulled from, and you may find some sources um, for your paper. I've done this ever since I've been in college. This is a gold mine. It's an easy way to find articles that are relevant to your and then you can sometimes end up going down a rabbit trail because you'll find this article's got even more articles this, that's related, or this article over here has articles that are related. So rather than spinning your wheels just trying to blindly search for something, bibliographic mining, always look at the references. I just, that's very important. I wanted to spend just a second to tell you about that. So that's very, very important. So let's go back and go back into the databases here. And so we're going to look at another one is Science Direct. And this is a subscription we have through here at Harding. And you can type in your, your keywords, just a search. You can do author name. And the journal title, volume, issue, and even pages, if you know it. And it covers everything. This covers everything from the physical sciences and engineering, including chemistry, chemical engineering, and then down to your life sciences, health sciences. So it, it's a very powerful database. And you can search in here. Like, let's just take a look at, uh, let's see. Nuclear power. That's going to bring back a lot of hits. Uh, yeah, look at that. It's uh, nearly five, nearly 500,000 results there. So we can lim try to limit this down considerably. Well, let's just, it says 2021 articles here. Um, these are articles would be what's called a preprint. Um, I would kind of stay away from preprint articles because preprint means they haven't been peer reviewed. You want to stick with articles that have been peer reviewed. Um, but I'm going to limit this to 2020. And you can also limit it by type. So I'm going to limit it by research article. And then I think I'm going to limit it by, let's see. Sometimes it will give you a subject you can. Uh, 
let's see, subject areas. Here we go. Let's enter let's do energy. So we went from now 400 and uh, nearly 500,000 results down to just 385. That's much more manageable. And so you could scroll through here and see if you see an article uh, that would be interesting um, to you in your area. And uh, like, for example, here, anything that says download PDF, then we've got it full text. If you click on this, it's just going to open up a PDF for you. Um, an article like this, uh, if you click on it, it just says abstract. So um, it says get access here. So we can search. We can try to search for that. And if we didn't have it, we can get this article uh, through uh, interlibrary loan, which would be real easy to do. And uh, you could, what you would do is there would be an interlibrary loan button that would pop up over here. And then you'd just click on it and just all you'd have to do is enter your classification as far as, far as like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and then um, put in that you're a chemistry major and it would be the article would be delivered to your inbox, to your email box, probably within 48 hours. So it's pretty fast. It's very efficient. That's a, a way to go about doing that. So let's go back. So Science Direct, you have a lot of your limiters over here. You can also go down here and clear all your filters. It's a very powerful database, very good source to use. Um, SciFinder, you have to sign up for it. I've never signed up for it, but I've heard that it's fairly useful by other chemistry majors who've signed up for a free account. Um, I need to get in there and, and play with that some more. So sorry, I'm not as familiar with that one. Um, PubMed is primarily a medical or biomedical database. It's uh, very, it's very, very, very good. It's a good, good database. I always click here to go to the advanced page. And in here they um, try to use the word and if you want to join concepts together and then that will help in your searching for topics. So for example, if we wanted to go in and look for, uh, let's try to look for something. Um, Occupational toxicology. That if I hit enter here, it just it puts it puts the and in between them. Or well, it didn't because I didn't put the and in there, but it drops it down to the query box, and then you just hit search and it will come back with the results. And in this case, it found 2,600 results. Um, just like the other databases we've just looked at, they have the limiters, which will help you because when you're looking for articles, less is more. You don't wanna have to comb through 2,000 articles. You don't even wanna have to comb through 300 if you don't have to. You wanna limit it down to just what is in your target specific area. So you have a slide device here. You can just click that, pull it, and we could get that within the last five years. Well, six years, so we stopped at 14 there, so that's still okay. And so that's, that dropped it down a little bit, but not substantially. Well, we wanted to say look for journal articles. Okay, dropped it down a little more, but not substantial. Uh, click here, and you've got additional filters. So we've got a journal article where you can limit the language to English. Uh, we could limit the subject to, we could do cancer and then just hit show and see what we find. Filters applied uh, and we still have 1,827. So, um, some you can keep trying to limit, and there's just so much out there that you can't limit. Um, and here you see this is a free PubMed Central article. You can click on that. We've got that article. Um, this one does not say that, so let's click on that and see. So it gives you an option over here to search bracket library, so we could search bracket library. And... So 
they were not a, we, we do not have a physical copy of that. So we can get one through interlibrary loan. So what you would do here is you would click this button if you wanted that article, for example, and it's gonna bring you to this form if you're already signed into pipeline. And then you should get the form, there we go. And all this stuff with your title and everything is already gonna be populated. Just scroll down and then all you'd have to do is enter your status and then your department, chemistry, and then hit submit. And then, like I said, it will go out and send you an email saying you've requested it. And usually within 24 or 48 hours, you'll get another email saying the article is there for you in your inbox. So that's an example of looking at PubMed and doing a search in PubMed there. So we can go back to PubMed. PubMed is very, very intuitive. It's very user friendly. And like I said, it's a very powerful database. It's, it's one of the best ones, especially for anything that's biomedical related. I was gonna show you one more database here while we're talking about them real quick. Um, let's see, let's just go back. A to Z databases. This one's called ProQuest. This is a very good general database, um, ProQuest Central. And uh, it offers the same kind of limiters and others that like the other databases. Um, see here, you've got where you can select what you would like a book or whether it be a dissertation or journal article, document type, we can select article, language. Um, and then in here, you just put in your topic. Say we wanted to look at uh, uh, lithium polymer batteries and uh, search. Okay, so we got 57,000 results, that's a lot. So then again, you just start by, you know, you plugging in your limiters, selecting your limiters, knocked it down to only 11,000 and you just keep, oh, do you wanna find it say in the last 10 years, last five years? Um, so that knocks it down to 7,000. I would never use the one that says limit to only full text because when you do that, you're limiting it to only articles that we have in the library. And as I said, with interlibrary loan, if you see an article that's out there in a journal we don't have, that looks just spot on for what your paper is, with uh, interlibrary loan, we can get it to you in about 48 hours max. So same kind of thing here. Um, it will usually say PDF if we've got it. If not, you know, we'll enter, we can get it interlibrary loan. But you can also change up your searches up here in the search bar. But ProQuest is a very good general database. It searches science, it searches uh, most any of the categories. And you can also limit it to certain databases within ProQuest. So, but, um, so anyway, I wanted to show you some ways uh, that I talk about scientific research, the process of it, uh, information sources, what's out there, kind of how to evaluate them, um, the library website where you can go in and uh, see some of the research guides, also how to use the book me feature, and also to um, show you some of the good science or chemistry uh, specific related databases and a quick run through of some of the ways you can search those and using the limiters. Um, this is not a one shot uh, um, video. Um, if you have any questions about anything at any time through the semester, um, use the book me feature, send me an email, call me in my office. I am more than happy to help you. We can go through a process going through looking at some of the databases if you're having trouble finding one or getting one through an interlibrary loan, I can help you do that. Um, I can get you in touch with people at the writing center if you have issues with, or uh, just having some difficulties putting together a paper. Or, you know, there's there's no problem with that. We have people that are more than happy to help you in any way. 
as, as we are here at the library with resources. And uh, if you have questions about APA style, you know, again, I can answer those questions for you. We are here, my colleagues and I, we are here for you and for you to succeed. And that's what we want to see. We want to see you be successful at whatever you choose to do, whether it, you remain in chemistry or you, whatever you do. That's what the library is here for, and that's what we're here for. So I hope that you have a great remaining roughly four weeks in the semester and a great semester starting next uh, starting in January as well. And uh, again, if you need anything, just let me know. And I, I hope that you have a blessed and safe remaining semester. Take care.